some extraordinary talks, and we just had to have him back. So, um, Dr. Chopper is a professor of medicine, is best selling author, is a former faculty dean at the Continuous Medical Education at Harvard, and is a senior consultant in hepatology at Beth Israel in Boston. And he will be talking to us today, and he has another talk tomorrow, but for today he's going to talk to us about microbiome, man and medicine, a revolution in modern medicine. Dr. Chopra. Thank you so very much. Um, thank you so very much for that uh, very kind introduction. I'm honored to be in your midst and to share with you some reflections on what I think is the hottest topic in medicine. Many centers, academic centers, are opening designated centers addressing the microbiome. So uh, when I was invited, I suggested to Eric about six or seven topics that I could speak on. And he suggested I speak on the microbiome and on leadership, so I'll be addressing that tomorrow. But my giving this talk reminds me of a, a British idiom, which says, be careful carrying colds to Newcastle. So as you know, Emrin, professor of medicine, has written a book on this topic. They have a center at UCLA. He has a blog. I listen to that blog on a frequent basis. And he's interviewed some of the world's experts in this particular field. I have no disclosure of relevance. The concept of the human microbiome was first suggested by Joshua Lederberg. He was a bacterial geneticist, and he actually got the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. And he said, it signifies the ecological community of commensal, symbiotic, and pathogenic microorganisms that literally share our body space. It's also been referred to as a newly discovered organ, the inner bacterial rainforest, the second human genome. And if we look at the population, just the gut microbiome, it's about 100 trillion. Microbes outnumber human cells significantly. Humans have 23,000 genes. Microbiome has 8 million genes. Most of the research has been done on the gut microbiome, but there's clearly microbiome on the skin, in the nasal cavity, in the mouth, in the vagina. And a lot of the research has been looked at, looking at bacteria, but we also have fungi, viruses, archaea. And at the end, I'm going to briefly mention something very intriguing called biological dark matter. The wonderful TED Talk by Nathan Wolf a biologist and explorer. You know something is important when it makes the cover of either Time Magazine or The Economist or The New York Times. Brief word about the evolutionary timeline. Mammals evolved about 200 million years ago, primates 60 million years ago, and the genus Homo, including human beings, about 2.5 million years ago. Microbes evolved about, by best estimates, 3.5 billion years ago. They're very dominant. By most studies, the GI tract is sterile at birth, although there is recent literature looking at amniotic fluid and finding bacteria there in about a third of the individuals. There's also bacteria microbiome in the brain, now that we are looking for it. So the GI tract gets colonized by bacteria within a few hours. The microbial bacteria are established by three to four weeks. There's a transition usually around four or five years. And the more than a thousand species of microbes take up house. In aggregate, they weigh approximately three pounds in the GI tract. And what shapes our microbiome? the very mode by which we enter this planet, whether it's vaginal delivery or C-section. I think many of you are familiar with the concept of how people born by C-section tend to have a higher risk of autoimmune disorders. We'll come back to that. Whether individuals get antibiotics, 
in the first six months or the first two years of life. Whether we take probiotics, where we live, whether we live in Los Angeles or rural Iowa, whether we travel, whether we have jet lag, what kind of diet do we consume? Vegetarian, vegan, fiber, coffee, exercise. There's some controversy about PPIs. We heard earlier today that they probably don't influence the small bowel microbiome, but other studies have been to the contrary. Malnutrition, all of these things can shape the microbiome. We are facing an epidemic of type 2 diabetes and obesity. I'm going to spend a few minutes about the role of the microbiome. So studies in mice as well as in humans show that gut microbiota differ in composition between obese and lean subjects. And there are notable differences in the ratio of certain species shown on this slide. This is a study that made it in science. And the reason is they did a very clever part of the study. The original part of the study was looking at four identical twins, all sisters, from Finland, where one was lean and the other was markedly obese. And they had very different gut microbiota, the lean versus the obese. But the clever part of the study is they took stool from the obese twin, mixed it with the food of the genetically lean mice, and they gained 30% body weight, developed insulin resistance. Took the stool of the lean twin, gave it to the genetically lean mice, mixed it with the food, the mice eat anything, and there was no increase in weight. So, <clears throat> very simple study, but there's also research now telling us that with bariatric surgery, it changes the gut microbiota, and that may be one of the reasons we get marked benefit, and even amelioration of diabetes within a few days after bariatric surgery in some patients before they have lost the 100 or 150 pounds of weight. So obesity is associated with changes in the intestinal microbiota. The obese microbiome seems to be more efficient in harvesting energy from the diet. Differences in gut microbiota could function as early diagnostic markers of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Butyrate, a product of intestinal microbes, may induce beneficial metabolic effects through enhancement of mitochondrial activity, prevention of metabolic endotoxemia, and even activation of intestinal gluconeogenesis. There's actually a crosstalk occurring between the microbiome and the mitochondria. It's a very interesting preliminary research. There's also crosstalk occurring between the gut bacteria and the brain. And central to that is the vagus nerve. The sage Ayurvedic physicians 5,000 years ago referred to the vagus nerve as the genius nadi, the brilliant vessel that transmitted messages. They cognized that. Here's a study about modulating gut microbiome and improving insulin sensitivity. A lot of these studies are very preliminary. They have small samples, 20 people, 18 people, 32 people. So here are 20 obese men with coronary artery disease, randomized to Mediterranean diet or low-fat, high-complex carbohydrate diet for one year. And they noticed that the bacterial composition and relationship with fecal and plasma metabolome had to be investigated. They evaluated it. Both diets were shown to exert a protective effect on the development of type 2 diabetes. Mediterranean diet increased Rosaburia genus, but the low-fat, high-complex carbohydrate diet increased a different bacterial species. Small study demonstrating anatomic and function changes in obese patients. 20 obese patients, 19 lean subjects. Obese patients had decrease in bacterial biodiversity. You'll see this term commonly used in the microbiome literature. Subjects with the highest gut microbial diversity had actually anatomical changes that could be seen on CAT scan in the hypothalamus, hippocampus, and caudate nucleus. And subjects with greater abundance of actinobacteria 
had better motor speed and attention. Bariatric surgery, as I mentioned earlier, affects gut microbiome composition. The gut microbiome is different in patients after gastric bypass surgery compared to obese controls. E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, all more common. And here's what's intriguing. Stool from gastric bypass patients transferred to germ-free mice. The mice now have improved fat oxidation. The microbe transplanted mice gained 43% less body fat compared to mice that received stool from a control. And the control, interestingly, was gastroplasty patients. So it's, it's the bariatric surgery, not the gastroplasty patients in whom this benefit was seen. What about pregnancy? We all know women get vain during pregnancy. A lot of them have tremendous difficulty after they deliver in, in losing that extra poundage. So the gut microbiota changes dramatically from the first to the third trimester with vast expansion of diversity between mothers, an overall increase in protobacteria, actinobacteria, and reduce biodiversity, reduce richness. Now, when transferred to germ-free mice, third trimester microbiota induced greater adiposity and insulin insensitivity compared to first trimester stool. This is shown schematically here. First trimester, normal microbiota, transplant into a normal mouse. The mouse remains normal. Third trimester, altered microbiota, transplant it, and you get a fatter mouse with insulin desensitization. Long-term infant outcomes appear to be influenced by mode of delivery. Children born by C-section are more likely to develop type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, hospitalization for gastroenteritis, asthma, and allergic rhinitis. But there could be more than one factor. It could be more than the difference in the microbiota. And I'll come back to that. What is this condition? You know it, don't be afraid to be right. Necrotizing. Necrotizing enterocolitis, right? The pediatric gastroenterologist would recognize this immediately. The radiologist would recognize this. So a study of 1,000 premature newborns, it's a horrific incidence, up to 6% incidence in premature newborns. It's one of the disorders in which we have made very little progress. There's still an astounding 36% mortality rate despite infectious disease consultants, neonatal ICUs. Why am I mentioning this? There's some very intriguing data. Oh, it didn't work, and then it... Premature newborns who survive the first two weeks have a much higher risk of dying from necrotizing enterocolitis. And the gut microbiota are different in these. But what's very interesting is that this dysbiosis is observed a few days before the clinical event. Remember, 36% mortality. So there's a potential window for intervention. Now there are studies being done in premature newborns where they're studying the microbiome. And if they see an alteration, they're getting randomized into an antibiotic or a probiotic versus placebo. And we'll have the answer in a couple of years. Is there a gut-brain connection? The immune system is active in myelin destruction. Alteration in gut flora in mice leads to an MS-like disease. It's called experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. And preliminary work suggests that the gut in MS patients contains bugs that drive inflammation and are low in the types of bacteria that control inflammation. This is an important reference in PNAS. Ingestion of lactobacillus strain regulates emotional behavior and central GABA receptor expression in a mouse via the vagus nerve. So there's crosstalk between gut microbiota and brain function. Germ-free mice restrained. If you restrain them, it leads to an exaggerated ACTH response. 
This response is partially reversed by colonization with fecal material from controls. Normal mice subjected to psychosocial stress have a decrease in bacterioides, increase in clostridia in the cecum. In human beings, probiotics may modulate brain activity. Bariatric surgery is followed by profound changes in microbiota and even improvement in memory in individuals who've undergone bariatric surgery. This is a complicated slide about the gut-brain axis. You can see that we have many messengers, 5-hydroxytryptamines, cytokines, bacterial molecules, fatty acids, GABA, 5-HT precursors. What I want you to pay attention to is the vagus nerve. There's very intriguing evidence that patients with Parkinson's disease, a common neurodegenerative disorder, many of them, their first symptom is constipation. And years later, they have classical Parkinson's disease. So some investigators decided to look at, I think this was a study from Sweden, a very large study, what is the effect of vagotomy? Does it lower the risk of Parkinson's disease? And to their astonishment, they found the answer was yes. And it was seen with truncal vagotomy, but not seen with parietal cell or supraselective vagotomy. So the human gut microbiota profile is significantly associated with brain microstructure and function. It was published a few years ago in one of the endocrine journals. What about stroke? Two colonies of mice. One of the mice, the gut bacteria were resistant to antibiotics. Group B, the gut bacteria were vulnerable to antibiotics. They included the carotid arteries produced ischemic stroke. Brain damage was 60% smaller in group B. So they included the carotid arteries. These mice were given antibiotics. They were susceptible. The other mice, same thing, carotid arteries included ischemic stroke. Bacteria resistant to antibiotics, 60% reduction in brain damage in group B mice. Fecal transplant from mice that had reduced brain damage were now given to naive mice. They developed an altered gut microbiome, not given antibiotics, just the stool transplant. Cerebral arteries occluded, again leading to ischemic stroke, again significant protection against brain damage seen. And they looked at the composition of immune cells, good regulatory T cells, and bad gamma delta T cells, and it was markedly altered. So these are the cells that determine what kind of inflammatory immune response the brain experiences after a stroke. Now, again, the caveat is a study in mice, and we don't have to rush in and start giving our patients having a stroke and antibiotic. Studies will be done when we have a better understanding about the gut microbiome. What about the diet microbe morbid union? How many of you have heard of TMAO? Raise your hands. Very few people. We put a lot of emphasis on cholesterol. Statins are the biggest blockbuster drugs that we use. There's something very intriguing called TMAO, trimethylamine oxide. And this is produced when we eat meat, when we eat eggs. Phosphatidylcholine converted to choline to TMA in the gut, by the gut bacteria. TMA is converted to TMAO in the, in the liver. Atheroma burden correlates with TMAO blood levels. Seminal paper, lead article in the New England Journal of Medicine some years ago from Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic has a patent on TMAO. You can get your patients to submit a sample of blood and they'll actually measure TMAO levels. So TMAO is produced when intestinal bacteria digest the nutrient lecithin. Human subjects after eating two hard-boiled eggs or a capsule of labeled lecithin have an increase in TMAO levels. However, when subjects are given broad-spectrum antibiotics, their TMAO levels are suppressed. The effect on the gut microbiota. High TMAO blood levels are associated with high risk of heart attack or stroke, independent of other risk factors and other blood test results. 
I work in Boston. I work at both the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. I talk to my cardiology colleagues. They're not aware of some of this research on TMAO. They don't measure it. They're focused on cholesterol and blood pressure, and that's fine, but this is, I think, an area that's been ignored. Now, dietary meat is a major source of TMAO in humans. As I mentioned, it's an independent risk factor for atherosclerosis. There's an intriguing animal model, ApoE deficient mice, and TMAO levels in these ApoE deficient mice correlate with atheroma burden. Looked at pathologically or angiographically. When ApoE deficient mice are treated with antibiotics, there is a significant decrease in atheroma burden. Popular diets have different effects on TMAO. Published recently, a high-fat diet, Atkins diet for four weeks, was associated with high levels of TMAO, whereas a low-fat Ornish diet for four weeks was associated with low levels of TMAO. You know, the one diet that can actually reverse angiographically coronary artery disease is a vegan diet. And on that diet, TMAO levels plummet dramatically. <coughs> So diet, indeed, is destiny. Fate is shaped by genome and microbiome. This is a reference in the New England Journal of Medicine from the Cleveland Clinic, Intestinal Microbial Metabolism of Phosphatidylcholine and Cardiovascular Risk. Worth reading this article and even considering measuring TMAO levels in patients who have coronary artery disease, they may not be a family history, they don't smoke, no diabetes, no hypertension, and yet they have coronary artery disease. Now, I want to pose this question. Do you think this person is trying to lose weight? He goes to McDonald's, he gets a double cheeseburger, double french fries, and two apple crisps. What do you think he or she orders with that meal? Diet duck, right? <laughs> so now the new total is 1441 calories. You see this all the time. Now, why am I mentioning this? Here's a study, artificial sweetness induced glucose intolerance by altering the gut microbiota. I tell my patients, I tell my friends, I tell my family, probably the two best drinks are water and coffee. And you know about the studies on coffee. There are about 30 studies about coffee being hepatoprotective. Seven cancers, low risk, common cancers, primary liver cancer, head and neck cancer, colon cancer, endometrial cancer, skin cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, low risk of Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism, low risk of gout, and now five studies, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Annals of Internal Medicine, coffee drinkers, men and women, have low total and cause-specific mortality. None of the studies has been sponsored by Starbucks. Right? And mechanistic explanations. Low levels of TNF-alpha, CRP. High levels of plasma, adiponectin. Low levels are linked with aggressive liver disease, particularly aggressive NASH. And very impressive, longer telomeres. You know, Elizabeth Blackman got the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for her work on telomeres and telomerase. Low, telo low telomere length is seen in mothers of chronically severely disabled children caregivers of Alzheimer's. Longer telomeres are seen in people who exercise, people who meditate, people who drink coffee. U.S. Nurses Health study, and what was very intriguing in that study is that increased caffeine intake is linked with shortened telomeres. Increased coffee intake is linked with longer telomeres. It's nothing to do with the caffeine. Coffee has a thousand constituents. So artificial sweetness induced glucose intolerance. I tell my patients and friends, if you want to have a drink, have water, have coffee, you're really dying to have a soda, have a little bit of regular Coca-Cola or Sprite, but don't have diet drinks, don't put artificial sweetness. Preliminary work shows vegan diet, high fiber diet, highly fermented foods, colostrum, have a favorable influence on the composition of the gut microbiome. What about autism spectrum disorder? Pregnant mice injected with artificially created virus-like DNA, the offspring display less socialization.
They're startled easily. They make few vocalizations. And if you look at their serum, it contains more than 45 times the amount of 4-ethylphenyl sulfate, which is a metabolite of gut bacteria. What about humans? Children with ASD have high concentrations of a similar compound, p in their urine. Healthy mice, when injected with 4-EPS, develop a leaky gut and develop ASD symptoms. Probiotic treatment with B. fragilis in ASD mice restores intestinal permeability and 4-EPS levels return to normal. This is a very recent tantalizing study. We're all familiar with the increased recognition, perhaps incidence, of autism. Nothing to do with vaccination. But here, they had 18 participants. They gave them a stool transplant from a healthy individual. Two years after treatment, marked improvement in symptoms. And two years after treatment, the gut microbiota remained altered. So this warrants a randomized placebo-controlled trial. There's a psychiatrist in Ireland. He's coined the term psychobiome. Emran actually interviewed him recently. It was a fascinating discussion. He's written a whole book about it, The Psychobiotic Revolution, Mood, Food, and the New Science of the Gut-Brain Connection. So gut microbes are essential. They're not freeloaders. They digest food. They produce anti-inflammatory chemicals and compounds. They guide the immune system to distinguish friend from foe. Few basic definitions. Prebiotics are selectively fermented products that confer changes in the composition and or activity of the GI tract microflora and presumably confer some health benefits. Probiotics are ingested microorganisms that are associated with some health benefits. The literature and the science is very limited. Pouchitis, antibiotic-associated diarrhea. One article from Chandigarh, India, in gastroenterology, marked improvement in patients with hepatic encephalopathy. Less rehospitalization, improvement in child score with a probiotic called VSL3. And yet, this is a huge market. Global sales of probiotics exceeded 40 billion in 2018. They estimated to exceed 64 billion next year. One of the issues with probiotics is there's no quality control. You get the probiotic, it says 1 million, 5 billion, 10 billion bacteria. Is that true? We don't know about that. They're not inexpensive either. I think in the future, there'll be precision probiotic. If I have certain symptoms, I'll submit a stool sample. They'll assay my microbiome, say, Sanji, for you, try VSL3, Philips Colon Health, and have Greek yogurt twice a week. Come back in a month, we'll retest your stool, show all the pro-inflammatory bacteria are suppressed and the good bacteria are thriving. There's an individual in Seattle. I met him recently. He has spawned a company, Vibiome. And you can actually get a sample of your stool tested for like $167. And then they give you eight pieces of advice. I'm not sure what that advice is based on. I think it's hit and miss. But I think uh, we need to stay tuned. And I think we'll see a lot of advance occurring in this field. So challenges regarding probiotics, standardization cost, novel ways of delivery. Some people are combining bacteria with chocolate as a successful combination for probiotic delivery. So more than a century ago, another Nobel laureate, Eli Mechnikov, said the dependence of the intestinal microbes on the food makes it possible for us to adopt measures to modify the flora in our bodies and to replace the harmful microbes by useful microbes. We know about the therapeutic implications. I mentioned there are very few. Antibiotic-associated diarrhea, maybe pouchitis, hepatic encephalopathy. And you're all familiar with recurrent C. diff. How many of you have used a stool transplant for recurrent C. diff? So a number of you. And how have you administered it? 
nasogastric tube, colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, different techniques. I met a young gastroenterologist from Florida three weeks ago. He has treated 19 successive patients with 100% success. He does a colonoscopy and puts that stool pellet dissolved in saline right next to the ileocecal valve, he, 19 out of 19. So this was, of course, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The Mass General Microbiology Department did a very simple, intriguing study, so again, a small study, 20 with recurrent C. diff. They took the stool, they froze it in a capsule, they tested it for HIV, HBV, HCV, negative, retested it a month later, negative, had the patient pinch the nose, close the eyes, and swallow it, all right? 14 of 20 resolved with one treatment, four of six non-responders with the second treatment. I call it the frozen poopsicle. <laughs> As you know, the number one treatment for refractory C. diff may well be number two. So probiotics, beneficial in hepatic encephalopathy. This is a study in gastroenterology from Chandigarh, India. Marked improvement in Charles Pew and Mel scores. This needs to be validated. We have our patients with horrific cirrhosis, hepatic encephalopathy, despite lactulose, rifaximin, they keep bouncing back into the hospital, getting admitted. If this turns out to be efficacious in a second study, it'll be a significant advance. Probiotics taken during pregnancy influence maternal and child outcomes. Probiotic milk consumption during early pregnancy reduces the risk of premature birth. But very importantly, during late pregnancy, reduce the risk of preeclampsia. That's a pretty deadly disease, right? With acute fatty liver of pregnancy, health syndrome, hepatic rupture, many different complications that can ensue. In recent years, there's been a sharp rise in rate of C-section in our country. Accompanying increase of asthma, allergies, eczema, obesity, et cetera, in the offspring. Is it the gut microbiome to blame? In addition to different microbiome with C-section, other factors may play a role. Mothers who get C-section often receive antibiotics. They tend to be heavier weight-wise. They may not be as often doing breastfeeding. They may be more obese. So now there are two FDA-approved studies in our country, one in Virginia, one in New York City. 800 newborns born by C-section will be randomized. They'll get either a placebo or they'll take a swab of the vagina from the mother right at the moment of delivery, smear it all over the skin, inside the mouth, inside the nostrils, and study outcomes down the road. I call it bacterial baptism. <laughs> what about microbiome and longevity? The fruit fly is remarkably similar to mammals in terms of biochemical pathways. Fruit flies fed with a symbiotic. I had to look up the definition of symbiotic. Probiotics combined with a herbal supplement had reduced inflammation, reduced oxidative stress, and a remarkable 60% increase in longevity. Probiotics dramatically changed the gut microbiota composition and also the way the food was metabolized by the fruit fly. There's a young student at MIT. He went to a professor and he said, let's start a nonprofit. It's called Open Biome. Rigorously tested stool preparations are provided to clinicians and researchers for transplantation research. As of a year ago, they had shipped more than 30,000 samples to researchers in more than 17 countries and to a network of 985 hospitals. Now, you should be aware the FDA just issued a warning about 10 days ago. There were two individuals in our country who received a fecal transplant from a healthy donor. These were immunocompromised individuals, and they both developed multidrug-resistant E. coli. One patient died. They then studied the stool of the donor, who was perfectly healthy, had the same E. coli in his stool. So there's going to be a temporary halt on stool transplants while this is figured out. But it's very important for us. 
even probiotics, you have to be cautious in people who have severe immunodeficiency. History of recurrent infections, otitis media, GI infections since early childhood. So let's summarize. Microbes appeared 3.5 billion years ago. There's crosstalk. They've been doing it for billions of years, yet to be silent. Gut microbiota affect obesity, cardiovascular disease, neurological disease, perhaps stroke, autism, spectrum disorder, Parkinson's disease, arthritis. I didn't show you a study. About 300,000 kids in our country get juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. They're much more likely to get it if they've received antibiotics in the first two years of life. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Necrotizing enterocolitis, diabetes, colon cancer. We're now studying it in all the major academic centers, IBD, IBS, pregnancy outcomes, perhaps even longevity in human beings in addition to the fruit fly. The composition of the microbiota is in flux, in flux and altered by a diverse array of factors. Microbiota-directed therapies so far include fecal transplants, hepatic encephalopathy, and more research is being done. In the last 30 seconds, have you heard of biological dark matter? So this is uncategorized genetic material found in humans that does not fall under the three existing domains of life, bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes. It may well be a fourth domain of life yet to be discovered. Nathan Wolf is a brilliant biologist and explorer, and he gave a talk at a school and during the Q&A, this 13-year-old girl puts up her hand. He said, yes, what's your question? She said, what is the next frontier to explore? And it got him thinking, and then he delivered this tremendous TED Talk, worth watching it and listening to. So biological dark matter accounts for 40 to 50% of the genetic material in the gut. 20% of the genetic material in the nose and even 1% to 2% of the genetic material in sterile Red Cross-approved blood that we infuse every single day in our patients. So he's given this brilliant TED Talk in 2015. It's called What's Left to Explore about Biological Dark Matter. So I think at the moment, this is a very hot topic in medicine, in science. There's research occurring all over the world. You will even see ads. I saw an ad this morning from a group in Australia. It's a physician, nurse, and manager saying, if you have difficulty getting stool transplants in America, come visit us. We'll also help you with accommodations. So very hot topic. Some people are doing it for science, some people for personal profit, and so on. We've only seen the tip of the iceberg. But I came across a different proverb recently shared with me by an African colleague. He said, we don't use the term tip of the iceberg. We say we've only seen the head of the hippo. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention.